introduce our uh, guest lecturer today, Dr. Camila Zaibo from the University of Ludwig South. Um, so in Europe, so you know this is top-notch stuff. Um, Dr. Zaibel was a former PhD student. She actually just defended uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, her PhD, and uh, she's a full doctor now. Um, and it is her expertise. Uh, her expertise is in machine learning and data science, and that's why I couldn't find a better person uh, to deliver this, this lecture um, than Camilla. Camilla is uh, uh, very charismatic and uh, very knowledgeable about the subject matter, and her career is an inspiration, to say the least. So um, I will leave the floor to her to get us through this introduction to machine learning. Some of you are struggling with the installation of TensorFlow and scikit-learn, et cetera. Um, if you don't have those sorted out right now, that's okay. Just follow through with Dr. Stiebel. She will share the Jupyter Notebooks with us. And um, without further ado, um, Dr. Stiebel, this is the this is your class now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> so let me share the screen with the slides. Um, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so welcome. Uh, today, we're going to talk about machine learning, and especially neural networks. So it's going to be uh, a bit different from what you've been learning so far in the numerical methods class. Um, and first, I wanted to say that machine learning and neural networks is, is a really broad uh, subject. So today, I can only give you uh, the basic fundamentals. And I decided to stick especially with, with neural networks and give you the really the mathematical fundamentals of neural networks, because I think that would be most helpful to you if you continue to learn this subject on your own later. But I wanted to start with, with the big picture of machine learning and tell you a little bit about what is machine learning in general, what kinds of tasks uh, we're interested in solving. Uh, so basically, if I, if I were to summarize machine learning in one sentence, I would say that it's programming computers to perform human-like reasoning or human-like tasks. And what do I mean by that? Well, for example, if I give you a picture like this, uh, and I ask you, is this a cat? Uh, for you, it's gonna be very easy to, to tell that no, this is not a cat, this is a dog, right? If I, for example, give you some data that is plotted in, in the Cartesian coordinates and in the XY coordinates, it looks like this, you're gonna, to, you're gonna be able to see that there's some pattern to that data, um, that, that data set, uh, is structured in, in, in such a way that, you know, it's not completely random data, but there is some structure to it that, you know, there's there's that peak value uh, and then and then it goes down. So you're gonna be you're gonna be able to see that there is some trend in that data set. Or for example, if I uh, if I give you a data that visualized in two dimensions looks like this, so you can see that my data points, for example, are structured in, in these three distinct clusters, right? So maybe those are measurements of uh, patients, you know, maybe those are uh, the, each point represents some patient. We've taken some maybe blood test measurements and those patients fall, fall into these distinct three groups three categories. And now let's say I, I have a new patient arriving and I take that patient's measurements and this patient lands uh, here where that black dot is. And I'll be able to tell, you know, just by looking at that visually, I'll be able to tell that that patient falls into this category one, whatever that is, right? Maybe, you know, that represents that the patient has, let's say, iron deficiency. So for, for a human, it's it's pretty easy to perform those, those tasks and make make those uh, 
that kind of reasoning. You know, it's very clear to see some patterns and a structure uh, in, in data sets. But if we were to program computers to perform similar reasoning, it's actually not that straightforward. So we actually have to put some effort into designing algorithms uh, that would perform tasks that to a human are pretty obvious. Uh, but if we succeed in, in doing that, then there are some advantages. So first of all, uh, the first advantage of machine learning is that computers can perform all of those tasks way faster than humans. So if I, for example, learned uh, that there are these three clusters from some medical measurements, and then I have, let's say, a thousand new patients arriving, uh, and, and I want to classify them, which category those patients fall into, then once I have a trained model, computer model, I can pass those thousand patients, and within you know one second or two seconds, I can get uh, the answer which which cluster a patient falls into. But you know, if if we were to give that task to a doctor, then they might spend a day uh, performing those classifications. And then another advantage of of having those machine learning algorithms is that at some point things actually start stop being uh, obvious to humans as well. So if we if we have a data set, for example, that has 100 different parameters, you know, how do you find a pattern uh, as a human in, in such a huge data set? So that's why we, we train computers to find those patterns for us. So from, from now on, I'm going to talk about neural networks uh, because uh, neural networks are actually the workhorse of, of a lot of those machine learning algorithms. And pretty much all of those tasks that I showed you here, so uh, you know, looking at pictures, determining clusters, all of those tasks can actually be performed by neural networks. So what do I mean by a neural network? Where, well, here's... Uh, a drawing of, of a neural network. Uh, it's really a series of mathematical operations. We'll go into the kind of mathy details of that. Uh, but it's it's a network of connected neurons. So it, every um, circle here on this graph represents one neuron. And then neurons are connected uh, with each other. So if we look, for example, at that layer over here, then every neuron from that layer is connected with every neuron from the previous layer and every neuron from the uh, from the next layer. And we have this special input layer and output layer. So at the input layer, we pass the input data to the network. And at the output layer, we recover some, some output data. And really all that is needed to train those neural networks is data. So we don't need any further assumptions, like for example, when you uh, when you were learning about linear regression, you were making some assumptions about what kind of functions do I want to fit into my data. For neural networks, you don't have to make those kinds of assumptions. You just fit the data and the neural network can uncover uh, whatever functional form uh, fits that data. And that data can come from experimental measurements, for example, just observations of the world, you know, pictures of dogs and cats, for example, numerical simulations that can also be uh, uh, that can also generate a data set for us. And the important thing is that the training data that we pass to the neural network has to come in this paired. Uh, input output. So we always have to have paired samples of, for every input, we need to have the corresponding output. That's the only way that we can train uh, those neural networks. But once we train them, then uh, if some new observation arrives or some, some new measurement arrives, then we can pass that through the trained network and it can give us some prediction that you know we 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 couldn't uh, 
get as as humans, but the neural network can can give us that prediction. So now we're going to go into kind of a bit more of a mathematical description um, of of neural networks, of what they're actually doing mathematically, how the values are being transferred through the neural networks. Um, and we're going to look first at a, just a single neuron and look at the description from the perspective of just that single neuron. Uh, so I took a neuron from from the interior of, of the neural network so that we have some neurons connected to it from kind of both sides. Um, so you can see that that particular neuron is connected to those three neurons from the previous layer and the five neurons from the, uh, from the next layer. And this kind of resembles uh, the, the, the biological neuron, which is maybe why uh why there there's this kind of biological terminology uh you know called neurons and neural networks uh so so a biological neuron you can think of it as there's some signal coming into the neuron the, the neuron maybe activates and then there is some signal transferred outside of the neuron and it kind of resembles you know that structure over here so if we now zoom in at that one particular neuron, let's call it J, then we have some uh, connections to that neuron, which come uh, from, from that previous layer. And I, I make this more general now. So we have, let's say we have I of those connections. Uh, and every connection to that neuron is associated with some weight. So we call these variables uh, W weights. Uh, and there's, again, I of them, as many as we have connections to that neuron. And then we also associate this quantity, which is just a single number, uh, Bj, which is a bias associated with, every, with that particular neuron. So there's one bias associated with every neuron. And those quantities W and B, they're just they're just numbers, uh, ju just single uh, numbers. <clears throat> so then at the other end of, of the neuron, there's some output from that neuron. So there's some, again, numerical value computed at the output of that neuron, uh, which we're going to call yj. And then from to kind of to the right of that neuron, we have again those connections to the to the next layer. So we have some other weights. Uh, I didn't index them because it becomes a little painful uh, with 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 so many uh, layers. At some point, it becomes painful to to index them, but they're going to have some some uh, index associated with them. So what a single neuron really does how how the output from that neuron is computed is according to that formula and we're going to go into a little bit more detail uh, ab about what what goes into that formula so <clears throat> if we if we take that formula uh, <clears throat> these quantities w i j those are the weights uh, that you saw on the picture earlier the quantity bj, that's the bias. And then here, with that summation, we're computing a linear combination of the inputs to that neuron. So we're basically taking a linear combination of uh, xi, x1 times w1j, plus x2 times w2j, and so on, all the way to uh, xi times wij. So that's the linear combination of the inputs with the associated weights. And we add the bias, which is just a single number. Uh, and then we have this function f, which kind of wraps uh, that, that whole quantity here. And we call that an activation function. Um, so there's there's a whole bunch of different activation functions that that you can use. Here are the four kind of more most uh, uh, most common. Uh, so hyperbolic tangent, uh, 
looks like this. Uh, it takes some arguments on the x-axis, so it will take some input, that activation function will take some argument, and it will um, return some value. For a hyperbolic tangent, that value is between minus one to one. Uh, sigmoid, it kind of has a similar shape, but the outputs are between zero and one. Uh, ReLU activation function, it's it's actually zero for negative values, and then uh, it's linear for positive uh, values for positive arguments, or a linear activation function, which is which is just a pass through activation. So it actually does nothing to to the argument. It re it returns the same output as as the argument. And there's many more uh, activation functions, but those are kind of the the most uh, popular ones. Today we're going to use the hyperbolic tangent and the and the linear activation. Okay, so so now I have a small task for you. Uh, let's say that uh, that we have a very special neural network where at, where the last neuron at the output can either return zero or one. It can only return those those two numbers, zero or one. If it returns zero, then that means we passed a picture of a cat to the neural network. If it returns one, then it means we passed a picture of a dog um, to, to the neural network. And now the my question is, uh, what are these two neurons going to return? So you, I give you that first neuron and that second neuron, and I want you to calculate the output value from those neurons. All right, uh, and we're going to use. Did you say something? I I, I couldn't hear. <laughs> I just said activity. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. So we're going to use uh, that following activation function, uh, which. Um, which is going to return zero if the input is negative, and it's going to return one if the input is positive. Uh, so basically your task here is to use that formula and calculate the exact value of those inputs and predict you know, whether it's gonna be a picture of a cat or a picture of a dog. So I'll give you a few minutes to tackle this. Okay, guys, this activity is my hand. Okay, just run. So, your objective now is to calculate that of this linear combination for the bias. So, first, start by doing this linear combination of. The inputs x times w plus x plus two times w two plus x three times w three plus b j, and then run through this activation function. If your number is negative, then the result is zero. If your number is positive, then the result is one. Okay. Why is m plus y equals one plus five from minus two plus two? Um, so the first one, the second one, so you have three times zero, two, so. 
Okay. So if I understand this correctly, when you're linking to the question of the dating act of the and then the new one figures out the things like that the just the the Okay, so I think uh, we're we're done with the activities. At least here's what I got for for the first YJ, I had one, and for the second YJ, I had zero. Same for miles, right? Um, who else got that? Okay, is is that correct, Camilla? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So. So the first neuron should predict a dog. So it should predict a value one. I think the the linear combination plus the bias uh, was two, right? Correct. Yes. Um, and so so if the argument to this activation function is two, then we're somewhere here, and the activation function should uh, evaluate to one. So it should predict a dog. And I think here it was minus two. Um, if I remember correctly, so <clears throat> so the activation function should return zero. Okay, um, so so now we're going to generalize this a little bit more. Um, we're going to try to write the mathematical expression for um, for how the values are transferred in a neural network. So. Uh... Camilla, we had a question. Um, yep, where, yep. Yeah, and I tried to clarify, but I think you will explain it better. Where are these numbers coming from, the XIs and the WIJs? Right. So in this case, you know, I just invented them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in practice, we're going to get to that in a few slides how these weights and these biases, they're obtained during training of a neural network. We're gonna get to that in, in just a few slides. Um, and this these X's, you know, in, in a neural network that really predicts, uh, you know, dogs and cats from pictures, that's, those would typically be really big neural networks. Uh, so maybe those values X are, you know, at the next to last, uh, layer of a neural network, you know, with many, many layers. Uh, and we're going to get into more details about how uh, how these weights and biases are are calculated in practice. Um, so now we wanted to 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 write a kind of even more general expression for uh, for how the values are transferred in that function from one layer to the next. Uh, and we're actually going to use that equation that that you saw before, but we're going to generalize it and write it in the matrix form because uh, for neural network with many layers and many neurons in every layer, uh, it becomes you know really painful to write a lot of these equations. So so we're actually going to uh, write this in a matrix form. So if we had a neural network exactly like this one, where let's say we have three inputs and then at the next layer we have four uh, four neurons, then we can predict, well, we can calculate the output values at all of these four neurons, so y1, y2, y3, y4. We can calculate them using an analogous formulation to this one, but written in the matrix form. So so this x1, x2, x3, uh, those are the inputs uh, that you see here. So that from the input layer. And now we have, uh, we multiply those inputs by the weights and we have as many weights as you see connections here. So there are three times four uh, weights. So 12 different weights one weight for every connection that you see here. And we can write, write those weights in the form of a matrix like this one here. 
Uh, and then there's the vector of biases. So for every neuron in that in that second layer, we have to associate a bias with that with that neuron. So there's going to be four biases. And that's what you see here. And this basically that's that's a vector matrix multiplication. We add another vector, which is those biases. And then we wrap everything with the activation function. So the activation function would then be applied element-wise uh, to, to the uh, vector that is computed from, from this uh, computation. So again, that's the matrix of weights, that's the vector of biases, that's the activation function. And now I wanted to make a connection with Keras, which we're going to use um, in a moment. Uh, so I wanted to mention that the way that I that I uh, structured that matrix is exactly the same way as Keras uh, uh, does that. So um, the matrix of weights has as many rows as there are neurons at the previous layer. So if we look at from the perspective of that layer uh, with the Y, I uh, outputs, then this is the previous layer. So we have three rows in that weight matrix. And it has as many columns uh, as we have neurons at the current uh, layer. So this is a three by four matrix. And that's the notation that Keras uses as well. And then the vector of biases, again, has as many elements as there are neurons in the current layer because we have to associate one bias for every neuron in that layer. Um, and also, if you look at uh, that first column from the weights matrix, so W1, uh, W2, W3, all, all associated with, with that first neuron, all of these three weights correspond to these three connections. So those are connections that lead to that first neuron, uh, Y1. Um, and same thing for uh, analogous thing for, for the second column. So the whole second column uh, will be all the connections that lead to the second neuron here, Y2. And you can also see that uh, as we perform this dot product, so that vector uh, times that, that matrix, then this is a linear combination of you know, all of these inputs, we compute a linear combination of these and that gets gets plugged into to that first neuron, um, Y1. Okay, so now we're gonna start with the first coding exercise. I wanted to kind of show you how this can be coded in Python be before we go any further. Uh, and then I'm gonna still come back to some of the theory. Uh, so we're going to use this first data set that you should have uh, that is called, the file name is called like this. Uh, this data set, if I plot it in, in, on a 2D plot, it looks like this. Uh, so on the x-axis, we have time in seconds. And on the y-axis, we have temperature in Kelvin. So this can represent some cooling of an object, for example. And it because there's kind of some noise in that data, it, it, this data set can come from, from measurements. So maybe I took a, a thermometer and I was measuring how an object is cooling. And what we're gonna do on that data set is we're gonna apply a regression. So we're gonna use a neural network to perform regression. Uh, so we're gonna hope that we're gonna get some line that is going to fit that data as best as possible. And the network that we're going to create uh, is going to look like this. So we have one input where we're going to input time. And we we have one output where we're going to output the temperature. We're going to be predicting the temperature. And we're going to create two hidden layers, those interior layers, the first one with five neurons, the second one with four neurons. So, so let's try to code uh, this. Uh, so here are all the packages that, that we're going to need. So NumPy, we're going to need NumPy. Time is the 
uh, it should be the built-in, uh, the standard Python package. Uh, we're going to import TensorFlow. Uh, we're going to import the sequential model from Keras. Uh, so that's that's how you should uh, import this. We're going to import uh, the dense class from Keras layers. From sklearn, we're going to import uh, this function, train test split. And uh, we're going to import pyplot, which you've probably used before. Uh, if you manage to install pandas, then we can use that as well. But this is kind of an optional package. It's just for, uh, for viewing the results. Now, the first thing uh, I would like you to do is to set this, uh, this quantity random seed to some integer, whatever you want, let's say 100. Uh, this is going to assure that our neural network training results are reproducible. So if you run the same code, let's say tomorrow, it's going to give you the same results. It's kind of a good practice to, uh, to, to keep that random seed uh, set to something so that your results are reproducible. Uh, here's a function that uh, you don't have to code. I'm just going to uh, run it myself just so that I can show you some of the diagnostic, but, uh, but you don't have to worry about this. So we're going to import the data set uh, from the CSV file. And this is how you can do this. So you can use the numpy function called gen from txt and pass the name of the CSV file. Uh, the delimiter is, is the comma. Uh, so we're going to input that data set. If you have pandas, then you can view that data set in the form of a table like this. Um, you can even uh, label the columns, so uh, the time and the temperature, um, and you can view uh, the values from, from some of the uh, rows of that data set. You can see that the time goes from time zero to time about two seconds, and temperature goes from 293 Kelvin to 290 Kelvin. So if I plot this data set, uh, I'm going to see something like this, which is uh, which is also what you saw. Yep. Uh, yeah, if uh, Camilla, if you don't mind going back to the notebook, they're still catching up with the sure the beginning. Okay, did you guys import everything? Yeah. Okay, so we'll give them thirty seconds quickly to import. Uh, um, okay, to import um, that first cell and do the random seed. You don't need to do the diagnostics um, function. All right, so um, if we've imported everything, uh, let's go down. Um, I think you can scroll down, Camilla. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So yeah, so you don't have to do the data frames if you don't have the pandas installed, but if you've taken stats, you probably already have pandas. It's just one way to see the data set. So this data set, there's no mystery in it. It's just a comma separated um, uh, values file. It has time and temperature in it separated by a comma, okay? So that's how it looks like. And you just import it with NumPy with gen from text. We'll just give them another minute. Sure. Okay, are we all in sync? No? Almost? 
you don't have to do the data frames, but if you want, if you already have it installed, just copy what's on the notebook. Okay, I think we can go next to the plot. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So that's just just a simple scatter plot. Uh, you don't have to plot the labels. Um... Yep. So we're just plotting the on the x-axis we're plotting time, and on the y-axis we're plotting um, the temperature. Yeah. So that's the first column from the data set and the second column. Yep, so you're taking all the data for time, it's all the data in, in column zero, and for the temperature values, it's all the data in column one. Yeah, that's what those um, that slicing means if you don't remember. Okay, we got it. Let's go. Oh, well. Okay. Okay. All right. So the next thing we're going to have to do is to scale the data. That's usually a good idea for uh, for training neural networks. Um, typically, people scale the data set to a zero to one range or minus one to one range. Um, and we're gonna stick with the zero to one range. I, I found that it works well for, for that problem. Uh, so to scale our data set, so to scale time, for example, to a zero to one range. You can see that originally it's between zero and two something, but we're going to kind of uh, shrink that scale, sc scale it to a zero to one range. And the same thing with temperature. In order to do that, we, we're going to have to subtract uh, the minimum from time and the minimum from temperature, and we're going to have to divide everything by uh, this quantity. So the maximum uh, minus the minimum. Uh, and we can do that already on the entire data set, so both on time and uh, temperature. Uh, but you have to keep uh, track, keep keep this axis equals zero um, argument. So this first uh, row, so center is equal to numpy dot min, of the data set is basically computing the minimum along the along the column, along the first column and then along the second column. It's computing the minimum of time and the minimum of temperature. Um, now, same thing with this uh, quantity. So NP max is computing the maximum of the time uh, along the time column and the maximum along the temperature column. <clears throat> and then we subtract the minimum uh, from that, that from the from the maximum. So now the scaled data set will be the original data set that we uploaded from from the file minus that center, which is the minimum, divided by that scale. So if we go ahead and, and run that uh, that cell, um, we can still inspect uh, the data set using pandas. Uh, you can see that time has now been scaled and it goes from zero to one and temperature goes from one to zero. If you don't have pandas, then uh, then we can you can just, uh, plot that data set again, the scale data set in the form of a scatter plot. <clears throat> and you're going to see that the time goes from zero to one and temperature goes from zero to one as well. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> the next important thing uh, we're going to have to do is to split our data set into train and test data. That's kind of for training purposes. Uh, 
for us to be able to see how the neural network training process has performed. And for this, we're going to use that train test split function from sklearn, which we imported uh, here. So from sklearn dot model selection, we imported train test split. It's a function that allows us to uh, sp split the data set into some observations are assigned to training as training data as some as test data. So the input to that function is the whatever data we decide to add as input to the neural network, which for us is going to be the first column from that data set. It's the time. And the second argument is whatever is going to be the output of our neural network, which for us is the second column from that data set. It's the temperature. Then we pass these uh, this parameter test size. Uh, it tells uh, that function what fraction of the data set do I want to have as my test data? In this case, I take 30% of my data as the test data. And here you can see that I set the random state to the random seed that, I, that we set uh, at the beginning of the notebook. I set it to 100. That's just so that again, we have, we can reproduce our results because those train and test samples are selected randomly. If we fix the random seed, you're always going to get the same random selection. <clears throat> now we evaluate that function to all of these four quantities. So we're going to get uh, the input to the neural network, the train samples, the test samples, and the output to, of the neural network, the train samples and the test samples. So again, if we go ahead and run the cell, uh, here I have a, a function that, here I have uh, some some uh, code that that visualizes exactly which samples were assigned as trained and as tests by, by that train test split. Uh, I color the, the test samples in red and the black, uh, black dots are, are the training data. So you can see that the test samples were just randomly selected from, from my data set, <clears throat> and there's about 30% of them. Okay, so, so now it's it's time to, to set up our neural network finally. So just to go back to, to the slides, we wanted to create an architecture that looks like this. We have one input, five neurons, four neurons, one output. And first, we're going to set, again, the random seed for TensorFlow. We're going to tell TensorFlow uh, to use that particular random seed. It's, again, for result, results reproducibility. Any randomness that happens uh, during setting up the neural network uh, is going to be set with that random seed. So you're always going to have get the same results. And now to generate that architecture, we're going to use the sequential uh, model from Keras. The sequential uh, basically means that the layers are uh, stacked in, in a sequence like this. So we use a sequential class from Keras. Uh, we're going to call our, our neural network model model. Um, and now we're going to create the layers. Uh, so the first layers layer, we actually are going to start with this one. So the layer that has five neurons. Uh, the first argument to, to that class of dense is how many neurons I want to have in, in my layer. And for this first layer, I'm going to have to also say, what is the input dimension? So how many neurons input neurons I have connecting to that first layer. In this case, I have just one neuron. So this is going to be just the time. So I put one. And that particular layer has five neurons. <clears throat> the dense uh, class from Keras uh, is allows us to build one single uh, layer in a neural network. And the, the dense class 
uh, basically uh, behaves according to, to this formula. Um, and the third uh, parameter that we're going to pass here is the activation function. So this is that function f uh, that we wrap this whole uh, computation with. So we're going to use the hyperbolic tangent activation for, for the first layer and for the second layer. At the last layer, we're going to use a linear activation function. <clears throat> so now that we have the first layer, so we've created the dense layer with five neurons, uh, the second layer after it uh, should have four neurons. So we're going to pass number four, we're going to use a hyperbolic tangent activation with that layer. And now we no longer have to tell what are, what is the input dimension because uh, the sequential model already understands this sequence of layers. It understands that it should connect that layer to this layer. So that's, that's all that we have to write. And then the final <clears throat> layer, which is this one, the output layer, it has just one neuron, and we're going to use a linear activation uh, function here at that last connection. So this is how you how you create an, an architecture. Uh, and later, if if you want to play at home, uh, you can add extra layers. You know, you can copy this and uh, add a bunch bunch more layers, uh, change the number of neurons here. Um, but this is actually a very simple data set, uh, and, and this is a perfectly enough architecture for us to be able to perform regression. <clears throat> okay, the next uh, important thing to do is we need to compile the model. By compiling, all that we are, uh, we are saying is what kind of optimizer uh, will be used in training the regression model. We'll get to that. I'm going to explain the theory behind that a little bit more later. And, and we tell which loss function, which how errors are measured within a neural network. So that's the second parameter. So these are two inputs to this, uh, to this function compile. The optimizer and the loss function. I'm going to explain that uh, in a moment. So we're going to run this uh, the cell, and the question I have for you now that you can try to solve is: What are the shapes and weights? Shapes of the weights matrices and the biases vectors from each of these uh, layers. <clears throat> so we're, we're going to have to train uh, three different weights matrices, W1, W2, W3, and three different biases vectors. And my question is, what are the shapes of all of these uh, matrices and vectors? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
each column that corresponds to the weights so the first new on from that third layer. First new on has a bunch of this all this. This is a lot of these kind of issues. So I get mixed up. Uh, it's just okay. So the way you write this, okay, so we have this. Oh, it's not like it's too big. No, no, you're not multiplying these two layers. So you're still the neutral is going to do that. So then you can put that in the GX, multiply by the weights that connects from the level to that. So you do it like that. Burn this one. What you do the first thing is to by that thing simplifies that summation. Yeah. As many summations as there are the areas of the So, this is excellent. I think that's not what Five ways to each layer on on the third layer. So, you have four columns, right? By five columns. <laughs> Remember the numbering W I J. So if for you are J, okay, so you have actually have well, there's five of the there's five Right, but the size of the matrix is written from the perspective of the receptor to receptor. So it's going to be four by two. And then the last layer, that last one, is only one row and five columns by four columns. The first one, which here is five in the row. You can do it for the first For the first layer, it has one, two, three, four, five, 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 five, four, 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 Five rows by four columns, right? Because the columns is the number of the columns. And the last one is going to be um, five by four by one. All right. I think we're ready. I think we're ready to see. I think we're ready to see the answer. Okay. Okay. So that's the answer. <clears throat> so remember the weights matrices always have the shape of the number of neurons from the previous layer by the number of neurons from the next, from the current layer. So we're going to have one by five, five by four, four by one matrices. And the uh, length of the bias vector is always the same as the number of neurons in any particular layer. So we have five biases here, four biases here, and one bias here. <clears throat> So in, in Python, you can access those weights and biases. You can find out exactly what they are uh, by calling this function get weights on the model, on the compiled model. Uh, if we go ahead and do that, uh, I here have some uh, printing uh, stuff that will show us those shapes of those matrices. So um, so the first layer, one by five, uh, the next layer, five by four, and four by one. Uh, and I can even print uh, what those weights and biases are. Remember that we still didn't train the network. So those are the weights and biases uh, at the initial stage of the network. They are initialized at the beginning to uh, some specific values. You can see that the bias vector is initialized to zeros. It's going to change during trading. Uh, the weights matrices are initialized to uh, to some random numbers that are generated from some specific distribution. Um, 
that's kind of the default uh, setting in, in Keras. Uh, you can change those settings. You can initialize those weights and biases yourself if you have some, some uh, you know, better understanding of, of how, it, how they should be initialized for your problem. And only now we're going to actually train the regression model. So this cell over here, uh, we do, we're going to do model.fit. We're going to fit the model with the training uh, data, and we're going to train it <clears throat> for, let's say, 1,500 epochs. Those are kind of the, you can think of epochs as iterations uh, during which the data is passed through the network and those weights and biases are kind of established. Uh, I have some extra uh, lines here uh, to count the time that it takes for uh, that model to train. Uh, you can, you're gonna see that it takes a little bit longer than, <clears throat> than what you're probably typically used to. It's gonna take something like 30 seconds. Uh, probably to for for this uh, neural network to train. Uh, it's it's a small data set, but it already you know as you can see that the notebook is is calculating. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna wait for this to finish. Okay, it took, took twenty six seconds to complete, and now uh, now the network is trained. We can again access. Uh, those weights and biases. If we do, we copy this code, um, paste it here. We can access those weights and biases. We can print them. We copy that code uh, and print those weights and biases. Then you're going to see that they are different now, right? So the biases were zero initially, but after training, <clears throat> they have changed. They were established to to some some values. Uh, the weights have changed as well. Um, okay. So here I'm doing some plotting that you don't have to do. Uh, I'm basically visualizing how well the network has trained and we're gonna get to that. I'm gonna try to explain that to you in a moment. <clears throat> so, um, First, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a prediction based on our trained model. I'm going to try to fit that regression uh, line into the model. Um, I'm going to create uh, some time samples between 0 and 1. Remember that we scaled the time to a 0 to 1 range. So I'm going to create some samples between 0 and 1, let's say 200 samples. Uh, and I'm going to call this function dot predict on my trained model, uh, which is going to uh, return predictions. And you can see that I have now that uh, regression line that, that fits my data. And maybe it doesn't fit it perfectly well. We can see that still maybe you could, you could still do better. Uh, if, if you feel that your model still isn't, isn't doing well, you can keep training the model. I can actually go back to this uh, cell where we did model.fit and maybe I can train it for 500 more iterations, 500 more epochs. So I set 500 extra epochs. When I now execute the cell, it's not going to start from scratch. It's going to continue training uh, from where it finished the last time. So now it just took eight seconds because I only had 500 iterations. Uh, now we're going to predict again. Better. And maybe now there's there's a, a better fit at those edges uh, of the data. OK, so. Um, now I wanted to go back to 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 a little bit of of the theory. So that function model predict <clears throat> that we called on the trained model, uh, it's what it's doing under the hood is it's really doing all of those vector matrix multiplications and wrapping with the activation function for us. So we had a very simple architecture, just three uh, layers. 
And how the temperature is computed at the output is according to this formula. So what you can see here is we have that time as the input. Uh, it's being multiplied by the weights matrix from that first connection. We add the biases from that first connection. We wrap them with the first activation function, which in our case was the hyperbolic tangent. <clears throat> and now this whole computation here becomes the input to the next layer. So now this is treated as the input to the next layer. We multiply that by another, by the second matrix of weights, this W2 from that second layer. We add the biases. We again wrap this with the second activation function, which was <clears throat> the hyperbolic tangent again. <clears throat> and now this whole thing becomes the input to that third layer. So this gets multiplied by this the, by the third matrix of weights. We add the biases, we wrap with the third activation function. And that third activation function was a linear uh, function. So it's, it's just a pass through. It's as if there was nothing standing here before that large uh, bracket in our case. So you can see that this is a pretty long, it starts to be a pretty long computation. <clears throat> and if you have many more layers, it becomes even larger. So that, that function uh, dot predict is basically making our life easier. So it's, it's keeping track of all of those activation functions, weights and biases. And I wanted to make a connection here when you were learning about uh, linear regression, you use this function uh, polyval, which was computing the regression based on the, the coefficients that the, that you computed. And this is sort of like, like that function polyval. It's, it's basically keeping track of all of those learned coefficients. So here's some exercise for you that you can do at home. We're not going to do this uh, now. I'm, uh, it's, it's a fun exercise to try to code this whole thing yourself and make sure that this function dot predict is, is giving the same uh, output, uh, but we're not gonna do this now. So I wanted to uh, now tell you a little bit more about the training process, what it, what it really means in the world of neural networks. So the goal of training or learning really means uh, finding the values for those weights and biases, because that's that's the ultimate goal. Uh, we we need those values to set just right so that we get good predictions from the neural network. So what what are the knowns uh, during training is the input data and the output data. So that's I, I mentioned to you before that it has to come in pairs. We need to pair the input with the corresponding output. <clears throat> so these are the known uh, values. What are the unknowns are the weights and biases from every layer. So we don't know those matrices of weights. We don't know those, those vectors of biases. Uh, we want to learn them. And we do that by solving an optimization problem. Uh, and that optimization problem basically boils down to minimizing some loss function, some error function, uh, which we can call L. And if you recall, again, when you studied linear regression, um, you were uh, trying to minimize, in the least square sense, you were trying to minimize this objective function. Uh, and the neural network is doing sort of the same thing, a very similar thing. So for linear regression, you are computing the derivatives with respect to all of the model coefficients. So let's say A and B, you were setting those derivatives to zero and, uh, and deriving those, those parameters A and B. Now for the neural network, we're also going to involve derivatives, but there's going to be many of them in general because we need to write derivatives for all of these weights from all of these layers and for all of those biases, again, for all, from all of these layers.
So it becomes a really big optimization problem. There's a lot of those coefficients that, uh, that we have to optimize simultaneously. Now, the interesting thing is <clears throat> and there's this function model.summary, which we're going to call now. Uh, it, it gives you something like a summary of, of your neural network model that you've built so far. <clears throat> and you can see that it tells us that the total number of parameters is 39 for, for, for this neural network that we just trained. Uh, the, the number 39 is basically the number of all of those weights and biases uh, for, for our neural network. So if I go back um, to, to this figure, for example, so this number 39 uh, comes from basically, maybe this, this figure is better. So we have uh, five weights in that first layer, uh, we have 20 weights in that second layer, four weights in that third layer, uh, and then five biases, four biases here, one bias here. All, all of these sum up to 39. So we have 39 different uh, parameters that we have to optimize uh, simultaneously. Uh, so those are always optimized based on some loss function, which measures some error of how good are we predicting the output. Um, and the least squares error, the one that you saw before uh, in, in, in when learning linear regression is often a, a, a really good choice for regression task and is also used in, in neural networks. But there's also many more uh, loss functions that you can choose. So mean absolute error, mean squared logarithmic error, uh, you can use cosine similarity if, if your outputs are vectors and you're interested in learning the good direction of a vector. Or some more exotic functions like binary cross entropy, which is uh, which is actually not suitable for regression tasks. It's it's suitable for classification tasks. And you can also create your own loss functions if 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 you want to. Keras allows you to input custom loss functions. So now I wanted to just talk about uh, uh, briefly um, about optimization. <clears throat> so what the optimization algorithm does is it is it essentially travels the landscape of that loss functions and it's trying to find a minimum in, in that landscape. So if you imagine if if I had a very simple neural network where I just need to know the values for two weights, so W11 and W12. <clears throat> let's say, you know, in, in this case, I needed 39 parameters, but let's say I have a very simple neural network where I just need to know, need to find out two of these values for the weights. I can measure the loss for any pair of these weights, W1, W2, <clears throat> and maybe that loss uh, landscape looks like this. So there are some maxima, there are some minima. Uh, you know, if I if I set the weights to a value that lands somewhere here, then that's a very bad choice for, for those weights. But maybe there is some minimum and we want to land in that minimum. So what the optimization algorithm is doing under the hood of, of training such a neural network is it's starting somewhere uh, and it's trying to travel that landscape and land in that minimum. Um, and what I wanted to mention is, is that usually the best we can hope for is that we're going to find a good local minimum, a good enough local minimum. It's it's very rarely that we we can hope for landing in the global minimum. Uh, and there's actually many, many local minima typically in training such neural networks. Um, one popular optimizer that is being used, so, so it's, it's an optimization algorithm that performs that, that traveling through that landscape is called Atom. It's doing great in descent under the hood. I'm not going to go into the details of that. Uh, I'll, I'll give you some resources if you're interested uh, in learning more. <clears throat> But there's an important 
hyperparameter uh -huh, that we need to pass to the optimizer, which is called the learning rate. Uh, and if you recall, where we uh, where we written uh, the model compile, we were giving the optimizer uh, to that compile function. We've been we've been using Atom, which is what I what I have here, and we've also uh, included that learning rate. Um, that learning rate tells the step that the algorithm is taking when traveling that landscape. So a big learning rate uh, is going to allow you to travel faster through that landscape, but maybe you're going to miss some local minima. Uh, but very a very tiny learning rate is going to um, increase the time of training of such a neural network is because you're going to take very tiny steps. So you want to set that learning rate just, just right. Uh, and in many of in some of those optimization algorithms, the learning rate that you pass is actually only used at the first iteration. It's just the first step that the algorithm takes, and then it adjusts automatically the learning rate at, at the later stages. So keep that in mind that sometimes it's just the uh, you're only setting the learning rate at the very first iteration. And then it's it's going to change. It's going to be adaptive. So here's some example that uh, you know I showed you before that if if your model is not trained long enough, then you might not get the best prediction. Um, and then we have another exercise which I'm not sure we're going to manage to. Uh, to cover uh, today. Yeah, we uh, we probably um, should leave some room for questions now and discussion. Right. We have about eight yeah. minutes. Let me put a power adapter. <laughs> There's also some extra kind of things to watch out for that that I wanted to, to tell you about if you now go on your own uh, learning neural networks. The important thing to, to pay attention to is that the value predicted at the output is going to depend on the activation function that you have at that last layer. And the reason for this is that if let's say you use a hyperbolic tangent activation at the last layer, then the hyperbolic tangent, the, the range of the hyperbolic tangent only goes from minus one to one. So the outputs can only be predicted to a value in that range between minus one and one. Um, so if you're predicting, for example, temperature that is, you know, that has numerical value, I don't know, let's say 200 to 300 kelvins, then such a neural network will not be able to predict that value. And the way to go about this is you either uh, change the activation function or you scale your temperature to be in that range, in the minus one to one range. That's something to watch out for if... If you happen to see suddenly really huge errors, really huge loss, losses in, in the neural network, uh, that can mean that, uh, that your values at the outputs are not predicted uh, to their, in the right range where they should be. Uh, similarly, the sigmoid function can only predict values between 0 and 1. But a linear activation function can potentially predict any value. So that's uh, if, if you have really large numerical ranges, then you can use the linear activation. Let's, uh, let's thank Dr. Camilla. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I, clearly, the world of machine learning um, is huge, but 
Um, I, I did have a question, um, and frankly, this is a very useful example um, that you went through for me. Um, but the way I'm thinking about this, this is uh, a neural network is nothing more than a model with a bunch of parameters that you're trying to fit to minimize the error between your input data and output data. And you hope that that's gonna give you predictions. Um, that's kind of similar to what we did with regression. Um, and I do have a thought here to tie this back to linear, um, linear systems of equations. So with regression, we derived the regression um, system of equations, the normal equations, right? And that was a linear system of equations for the parameters, and we solved that exactly with numpy dot in algebra dot solve. Um, and I know um, early on when we were studying linear solvers, some of you are skeptical about why do we have to do iterative solvers, for example, or why do we have to find other methods to solve systems of equations? It's because of this. It, this is a simple neural network and does nothing, barely does anything, and has 39 parameters. But imagine taking something like chat GPT, which has 1.5 billion parameters, and imagine trying to build the system of equations for those weights and biases. It is unsolvable. Probably take you a lifetime or several centuries to solve that system exactly. So over here, instead, we have these optimizers, right? Camilla, correct me if I'm wrong, that we use gradient yep. descent essentially to solve, is to, and as an alternative to solving the system of linear equations, as a way, as a means to find um, the solution to those weights and abscissae, and so uh, and weights and um, and biases, right? Am, am I correct? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we learn what we learn. Yeah, Ethan. I'm just curious. How do you go about deciding how many um, layers? Yeah. Yeah. Layers. What functions to describe each thing? Yeah. Um, okay. Here's a good question. Um, Ethan is asking, how do we choose the number of hidden layers, the size of each hidden layer, and um, what? Yeah. What activation function to use? Right. Yeah. That that's the whole art of neural networks is to make those decisions. One thing that can guide you. Uh, we didn't go so much uh, into the details of this, but if I give you the notebook, you're going to be able to see this better. Uh, one, one thing that could guide you in those decisions is by looking at the loss for the train and the test or the validation uh, data. Ideally, you would like the, the loss for the train and the validation data to follow closely. Like you don't want the train data to be very low and the validation uh, data loss to be very high. That could, for example, indicate overfitting. So like too large architecture, for example. And from there, it really is a bit of an art to, to, to get those parameters light, right. There are some guidelines that you can use, you, you know, you can find online some, some, some guidelines that can help you make those decisions. Uh, but really, you know, you're just going to have to perform a couple of manual tests and see what architecture, you know, how many layers, how many neurons, what activation functions to use. And, and the more you do it, you hope to get better at it, right? For a given, um, for a given domain yeah. and problem space, you're working with heat transfer, you're working with classification, you're working with language models then you start getting into knowing like how many hidden layers you need, how many um, neurons per layer. Um, but the first step is to just take these notebooks and just build, build on them. Um, I had another question, um, Camilla. The, how do you figure out... So the example you gave um, uh, had the temperature and time. Uh, time was the independent variable and temperature was the dependent variable. And that was kind of a clear cut example. And I know you had the other example where you wanted to show where um, if you can't get the independent variables, um, figure them out correctly, then you're gonna mess up your entire neural network. So do you have, mm -hmm. what, what do you have to say? What would you say about that? 
just trying to figure out mm -hmm. what parameters control your um, neural network. Right. So again, you can look at those losses and in the exam, the second example that you can play, you know, at home, uh, you're going to see that when we didn't get the input parameters right, the loss actually stays pretty high. So you, you get high errors in the neural network, while the, the moment when we when we get the right set of input parameters, the loss drops, you know, two orders of magnitude. So you can, again, monitoring this loss uh, in, in those plots that look more or less like this is 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 a very good idea to make those decisions. Um, there are some some other ideas on on which input parameters um, are the most critical. They kind of involve other techniques beyond neural networks, like you know principal variable selection and to, to tell you which variables you know say you have a data set with hundred in potential input variables, which one of those are really crucial. There are some tools available in scikit-learn that you can use to to guide you which of your parameters might be good candidates for input. Yeah, so say you had temperature dependence on pressure, density, um, molecular weight, you know, other values, like which one of those uh, is the temperature going to be most, most sensitive to to represent the data? And if you try to do the neural network as a function of the density, whereas the temperature is going to depend also on, on the pressure, then your loss is always going to be high until you realize, oh, I missed an additional input. Um, or perhaps you could find that like, the sensitivity on one of the, on the pressure, for example, is not that high. So I could get away with representing the whole thing as a function of the density, for example. Right. So, you know, there's a lot. Yeah, you put Right. You potentially don't want to take very correlated variables as inputs as well. Well, it's, uh, yes. So, so um, uh, I, I think I can answer this question. Um, it's not guessing randomly. It's using a method called gradient descent um, to try to find, to minimize the error. So it's going to guess, take a guess and try to move in the direction to find the best set of those coefficients, right? So that the total average is minimized, okay? But it doesn't solve a linear system it, it, because it's very expensive to solve it. So it, try, it does this gradient descent method and it's an iterative method, okay? And the learning rate, think of it as a time step um, in the sense of what we did with ODEs. So you get that initial set, how far can we, reverse this curve to find the minimum. Um, and the number of epochs is how many steps you're taking. Um, you know, you might get to the minimum, you might not get to it, um, but once you're at a minimum, then you can, you know, you can get there and be stuck over there and then no improvement will be made. <laughs> All right, well, um, Thank you so much again, um, Dr. Zdaibel. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And um, to you all, thank you for attending. And I hope this was helpful. All right. Thank you so much.